there's two things that uh, uh, I worry about. Uh, one is um, uh, increasingly sharp uh, economic inequality uh, across the region. Uh, for many years we thought of Asia as a region in which there was uh, rapid uh, rises in income uh, and reasonably fairly distributed income by world standards. That's no longer the case. Uh, Asia's becoming, uh, and certain parts of it in particular, most conspicuously China, uh, is becoming um, quite sharply uh, uh, unequal. And that uh, sooner or later uh, is likely to have social and political consequences. That's one thing I worry about and I don't think we give enough attention to. Uh, another thing that I worry about, again linking to my research, is I think most of us have in our mind an image of government uh, across Asia, whichever particular parts of the region people are interested in. And it's an image of government which is, uh, by the standards of the developing world, very capable government. Uh, quite competent executive government. And I think that's decreasingly true. I think it's becoming less and less the case that government in Asia is really capable. That the scariest part of the future, not only in Asia but also in Asia, is external sources of instability. I worry less about what's going to happen with in the country or even in the region than I do with a destabilizing external event, um, trend, uh, intervention, accident even, uh, that will provoke reactions that are actually uh, negative in their consequences, not only for Asia but for other places. I say that as a historian. So often some of the things that we foresee in a, in a straight line from the present to the future are derailed by things that we can't foresee. And so I worry more about external shakeups than I do about internal shifts. Water. Water is a very big issue. I've been working for a long time on environmental problems in China. Um, and looking at climate change, looking at the energy security issues related to that. Um, and I've come to the realization that perhaps what is most critical is what is most essential to human survival, that of water. Um, and it's not only China, it's Asia as a whole. Um, Asia has fairly abundant water resources, but of course on a per capita basis, it's really quite small, the smallest of any continent, something like 2,800 cubic meters per person. Um, and the problem is that that water is unevenly distributed um, within countries and, and across countries. So the question is how to get water from one place to another, and that can cause a lot of concern. But increasingly, as there is a competition over the uses of that water, not only for livelihoods, for irrigation, but for hydropower, I think we're going to see more, more tensions. And what worries me most is that particularly in where I've been working in the Himalayas, um, there are a real lack of institutions for mediating some of those tensions over, over water. I think the uh, major issues that uh, would keep me up at night is growing resource and growing population imbalance. Uh, in China, for example, the uh, female-male uh, ratio is increasingly skewed and it will and presents the possibility of massive social problems in the future, which may require or at least uh, elicit uh, political responses that uh, will not be useful for anybody. Uh, and a uh, link to this uh, in a kind of ironic way is the fact that uh, the growing prosperity of uh, East Asia is not, of Asia in general, is nowhere being matched by the growing availability of global resources. Hence, uh, there, is an, there is an effect, a growing shortage of resources on the basis of economic uh, development, which again is a kind of ironic or indeed paradoxical uh, circumstance. Well, actually it's just one particular issue. I'm really concerned about 
um, migrant populations in Thailand that are from Burma um, because a lot of my field work has been done amongst these people so I know them personally. There's 300,000 estimated uh, ethnic Shan migrants in northern Thailand, a total of close to 2 million people in from Burma in Thailand and if all of these opening up so-called democratic transitions are just window dressing to appease to Western countries in Burma and Thailand. The Thai government decides to crack down on refugee camps and migrant workers from Burma that are in Thailand. This really could have very serious, very sobering effects for those people. So there's this um, part of me that constantly wonders if these democratic transitions aren't for real what are going to be the consequences for people in the border areas? It is the rising nationalism among various Asian nations that worries me quite a bit. And this nationalism not only involves territorial claims that historically uh, that you know each country would have on others, but also the kind of uh, the, the emotional side of the nationalism, that is uh, uh, beyond rational consideration. Um, and particularly with China, the country I'm more you know, interested in, I study most. And as China's economic rises, at the middle class growing, as more China's getting richer, and China's power becomes stronger in the region that you naturally has, have a certain group of Chinese, especially young people, has a very stronger, a strong national, nationalistic feelings. And that, of course, doesn't bode too well with the other neighbors, which also has, granted, also have, a, you know, a similar kind of nationalistic trend on the rise among its younger generation, be, be it in Korea, be it in Japan, or, or, or Vietnam and elsewhere, neighboring countries. So China's rise has caused both, both the Chinese themselves and the neighboring countries be kind of this, this you know, feeling of, distrust because nationalism group sometimes rule this distrust that distrust was worries me because that could spell ill in the in the region in terms of security in terms of other kind of interaction between among the countries no question it's climate change i i, I really do worry about the impact of of climate change and as someone who uh, works on philippine politics let me just use the philippines as an example historically the philippines is a land of extraordinary biodiversity it's been called uh, galapagos islands times 10 uh, just in terms of the of the rich diversity but if you look at what's happened to the philippine environment over the past uh, century or so first of all it's a country that is one of the most natural disaster prone countries in the world so there's already a number of, of strains that are there uh, but over the past half century or so all of the deforestation all of the ways in which watersheds have been uh, destroyed the way in which coastal environments have been destroyed already the philippine government and philippine political system has shown itself to be not very effective in dealing with those environmental problems now comes forth uh, climate change and the Philippines is uh, the uh, uh, third most affected country in the world in terms of uh, populations that will be affected by sea level rise after um, uh, China and India. So when we think of that, when we know that the natural disasters are there, the regular issues that we know about these mega typhoons that are coming through, uh, bringing forth such extraordinary flooding, mudslides and all sorts of things, that makes me lose sleep at night. What keeps me up at night is the potential for transnational issues to wreak havoc in Southeast Asia. Um, whether it comes to avian influenza or climate change, those t sorts of issues are, have the potential to do horrific damage on Southeast Asia. As you may know, Southeast Asia is a locus point for avian influenza. Indonesia has suffered more deaths from avian influenza than any other countries. The World Health Organization predicts that a mild pandemic, if it were to occur, could kill anywhere from three to seven million people. A more severe one could kill 40 million worldwide. Um, countries such as Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand have varying uh, 
ability, capacity, both technical and political, to grapple with this. Many of them, for uh, both political and economic reasons, have not taken sufficient measures to uh, both impose surveillance mechanisms and then lay out pandemic preparation plans that have any hope of really um, making a dent. As we saw in the case of swine flu, um, when a pandemic is announced, countries in the West, both the U.S. and others, tend to ensure that their citizens are first in line for the drugs that their pharmaceutical companies um, produce. So if in fact we were to see a pandemic outbreak of something like avian influenza, uh, I think that could have um, impacts of such a horrific nature that keeps me awake at night. Ooh, about, about us, Australia, and many other countries in the region mismanaging um, China's rise, including the Chinese mismanaging their own rise. and and getting those, the transition wrong. Um, uh, moving from a um, relatively prosperous region now with um, the trends in general in, in a good direction towards a more volatile, um, unstable transition. Uh, one of my concerns is that China's rapid growth, uh, rapid emergence as a, a global power is coming after a generation more than a generation of relative isolation and the instability that uh, this is already causing and the instability that this might continue to cause um, is something that keeps me up at night in particular whether or not global institutions uh, and other powers western powers in particular are able to accommodate china's emergence and uh, what I think will be an increasing demand uh, by China to have a global voice commensurate with its size uh, and uh, economic resources, economic influence. Um, and one of the things that I fear is that if uh, global institutions, if the uh, um, other powers in the world are unable to accommodate China, Given the fact that China's authoritarian government depends so much on uh, nationalism for its legitimacy, I fear that um, uh, there could be serious conflicts um, in the future. This is directly related to my research and it's really the, the misunderstanding that the Chinese government has about the threat of Tibetan Buddhism as a, a, a kind of to, their, to the stability of China, right? I mean, as some people have pointed out already, Tibetan autonomous regions are one quarter of the Chinese territory, so they are justifiably concerned about this area as needing stability. But they seem to misunderstand Tibetan Buddhism as being a threat and not understand. So most of my work is focused on the history of relations with Tibetan religious institutions and leaders with ruling, you know, states in based in Beijing, and the very positive past that has been, you know, up, you know, up to the 20th century, and the challenges uh, to communicate this idea to the rulers today that there can be a positive way for managing these relationships, and tightening is not the correct way. It's, we see the tighter things get, the worse things are. So that's what keeps me up.